Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. Uh, today we're really going to be getting into the details of how we go about figuring out how a gain medium works, and we're going to rely on a lot of other stuff. So just to remind you, we've covered cavity stability, beam propagation, how beams are formed, as well as longitudinal modes, um, and we're really getting at the details here of the gain medium. We've talked about how a gain medium or the different levels can be described by differential equations, and you should be very familiar with that before moving on. If you're not, I urge you to stop and review that mini lecture and make sure you're comfortable with that, because I'm going to assume you know it. And we also know from our little introductory lecture on quantum mechanics what this diagram right here means, the fact that there are different states electrons can be in in a single atom, but of course there are millions and billions and trillions of atoms inside this gain medium, typically and we know what this figure represents. If you're not familiar with that, please go ahead and, and review the other mini lecture on quantum mechanics to make sure you understand that. Okay, quick review of differential equations. Uh, we did an example where we looked at water and tanks. This is a very visceral and intuitive. It's something we all have experience with. We can get our hands on. And we see we can write differential equations for that. The same processes happen over here if we're describing a large collection of atoms or molecules that have particular energy levels and think of the energy level similar to the tanks that the higher the energy level the the more potential energy is in the electron that's stored up there and we can also write a series of differential equations for this there is one difference though that we're going to start to get to today is that we really want to know how this system this group of atoms that if taken as a whole has electrons in different energy levels interacts with photons and that's what Einstein discovered wrote some differential equations for and what we're going to go into today because how light interacts with material is really at the basis of how a laser works which is the overall thing of how we're trying to learn so let's get into that and I'm going to warn you that there's some preliminary information before we get into these differential equations I'm going to have to give you uh, assuming you probably don't remember chemistry or semiconductor physics that well Okay, now one of the big differences between a volume of water and a tank and writing a differential equation for that is that the units are different. Uh, if you're thinking about a, a block of gain material, as may be illustrated right here, with a bunch of atoms in it, the units of this are not volume, a meter cubed. Uh, this thing does have some volume, but we're, what we're really interested in is calculating how many atoms there are per unit volume. And so the n that appeared in those differential equations has units of per cubic meter and I'll warn you that because these are very large numbers this is more typically written as per cubic centimeter and this is the number you're going to see reported and you're going to have to be very careful to do conversion so the units work out don't just take the n that's given you because it's always given in per cubic centimeter and you're going to have to convert it um, if you think of a crystal, as may be illustrated here, with a bunch of atoms that we're interested in embedded in it to make a laser medium, this sort of makes a lot of, of sense. You can sort of think of BBs embedded in a block of jello, and that's kind of a good analogy uh, for what we're doing. Um, and we can have the same idea if we talk about a density of atoms, or excuse me, a density of photons. And again, this symbol right here is going to be my universal symbol to represent a photon because it's sort of an isolated wave packet. But um, generally when we talk about photons, and certainly what Einstein talks about, is we talk about how many photons there are in a given volume. And since photons are constantly moving in one direction, unlike these atoms, you sort of think of the photons at any instant of time. And each photon we know has energy h nu, where h is Planck's constant. And this is on the order of a couple of electron volts or a couple of 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so not only are there a certain number of photons within this block, but there's a certain amount of energy. And this symbol right here, this row of nu, represents the amount of energy in a given volume. It's the energy density, the joules per cubic volume or joules per meter cubed. This d nu at the end, you'll see in your book, and this represents the fact that 
this energy depends on the frequency of the photons. And so really what you've got to define, if you want to be technical about it, is that this energy density is only defined over a very narrow frequency range, delta nu. And we're going to assume that all our photons are at the same frequency for the time being. And there's an example uh, linked on the reading assignment for today on the website that shows what happens is if you, if you have a range of colors of light and how to handle that situation. But that's too long for me to go into here. So we're going to assume that we can just take this out because the frequency distribution of our photons is a delta function. They only occur at one color. Um, well, certainly, the number of photons per cubic meter is just the energy density, rho of nu per cubic meter, divided by the energy per photon, h nu. And notice one thing we're always going to encounter is that technically this is photons per cubic meter, but no physicist ever writes the photons because photons is not a unit of measurement. So this is always going to be written per cubic meter or per cubic centimeter, or meter to the minus 3, as you see here. Now, this gets a little bit confusing. I'm going to have some trouble getting this across. So forgive me if I have a little glitches in my presentation, because I always seem to have trouble with this. But this idea of energy density of photons, the number of joules per unit volume, uh, joules per cubic meter, is a little bit unusual. Because we usually think of light, when we usually think of light, we talk about power, the number of watts or joules per second, or the intensity of light, the power per unit area. So it's worth thinking and spending a little bit of time on how we convert between a energy density of photons and more usual units of power and intensity. And so let's go ahead and take a look at that. What we're going to assume is that we have a volume here. And we have some photons in the volume. And it has some length d that we're going to define later. And the x and y directions have unit length. So this is one meter on a side. And of course, we have some photons in the volume. And we know those photons are moving. And so here are photons. We have certainly a lot more than this. But let's say we've only got five photons in this volume. Now, what happens if we let these photons move? Certainly, they're going to come flying along, and they're all going to hit that target. And what we're interested in is the intensity, I, in watts per unit area, right? And we can see that these photons, and let me go back and, and redo this, these photons are going to come flying along, and the number of photons that hit this area in some unit time, one second, and let's write this. Remember that we can also write this as joules per second per area. The, the number of photons that hit, each carrying some amount of energy, h nu, in one second is going to give us the intensity if we have a unit area. So there they go. They're hitting. And in some time of about one second, the amount of power we measure is going to be the intensity. Um, well. What's the volume of this space that actually has photons that hit in one second? Um, well, we know this way and this way are one. We've defined that to be a unit. And what's our length d? Well, we know that the velocity of the photons is equal to the speed of light divided by whatever index of refraction of the medium there is. And we also know from physics that velocity is equal to delta c over delta t. Um, we've defined uh, one second to be our delta t. So let's write that delta t is equal to one second. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. In this case, delta z, the length of this volume, which I've defined in the picture to be d here, is just equal to the velocity times one second, which is c over n. And so the length of space that contains photons that will hit this area in one second is C over N. And this is meters per second, because we're defining, essentially, um, our meters to be in terms of one second. And of course, we cross the one second out because we've multiplied by this delta T here. 